This is going to be another talk on Alan Watts. I'd like to talk a little more about the way of realization as he understands it. But first, say a couple of words about what he means by realization. He says, fundamentally, it's a paradox. And this is typical of Alan. It's the willingness to be insecure. That's the ultimate security. The willingness to suffer is the essence of divine joy. The willingness to be finite is to know one's own infinity. Now these are all quotes from Alan. Let's take a look at this now, you see. The willingness to be insecure, don't change it. Don't try to do something about it. Right. The willingness to suffer, that's your reality. Right. The willingness to be infinite, not to accept it, to be infinite. This is religion looks at this and they criticize this drive for realization because it, it's total failure to be concerned with the universe and to try to transform it. It's basically egoistic from a religious viewpoint. <clears throat> However, Alan takes that charge. It's really a charge against him and people like himself. He says, no, you have to understand realization. Realization is really the conscious objectivization of that nature. It's the creative and the external expression of the self in the finite order. That's realization. Now, this is somewhat complex, but it's right here in the latter part of the expression. Realization, you see, is the expression of the self in the finite order. Now, he'll also talk about that from the Hindu viewpoint and say that Atman is the expression of the infinite order of Brahman. Now, he goes on to talk about realization. And this is actually realization heals society because realization is the inner spring of life and it is transformative to each individual. It goes within, out. It doesn't come down in order. This realization brings consciousness of what is true all the time in the unconscious, in the self and the spirit, which the ego doesn't know. It's actually the real age bringing to consciousness. I should change that, right? It's the bringing to consciousness rather than brings, right? It's bringing to consciousness what is true all the time in the unconscious, in the self and the spirit, which the ego doesn't know. See. It's bringing to consciousness what is true all the time in the unconscious in the, the self and the spirit. Because the ego can't know that, that's the paradox. Because we proceed in our explorations primarily from the point of view of the ego. Now, I want to say something about the way he expresses that. His language <clears throat> is filled with paradox. At times it's obtuse. But when he gets into the process, he's clear. When he gets in the process, he's clear. So let's talk about it. What's the process of realization? How does it begin? What's the process? Process must go from somewhere to somewhere. So how does it begin? He says, oh, he says, uh, you can't do anything about it. 
You can't begin it. If you have an interest in the subject, that's already the process, and it's already begun in you. So anyone that has an interest in the idea of self-realization, they don't have to do anything to get into it. They're already into it. That's the first step. That's the most important step right there, the first one. Because all human life is ordered and directed towards realization. That's its goal. That's its natural goal. That's where all life is going, to realization. So therefore, you don't have to look for it too hard. Life is in a process itself that it brings it about. The ego, which we identify... Now, you see, one of the problems in talking is that we inherit a vocabulary. And Alan inherits a psychological language and a Christian theological language. And therefore, he talks about the ego, the unconscious. And then, of course, he brings in other terms from his comparative study of religion. But these base metaphors are psychological. And then he shifts to Christian, which is, of course, his own background. Then when he reflects, he'll go to the next level and bring in Eastern concerns. And Eastern, in this case, can also be Greek Orthodox because he quotes quite a bit Berdyaev, Nicholas Berdyaev. All right, then. What's the problem? He says, the problem is that we identify with the ego. That's the problem. Now, what does that mean functionally? What does someone mean when they say they, they identify with the ego? It's really a constellation of thoughts that come and go that have a kind of unity to them and that they include the, all of the conflicts, all of the dreams and worldviews, right? the Weltanschauung, the worldviews of a person. It's this, it's the unity of this which necessarily shows itself up in the desires that we have, the wishes and the desires we have, because it's these together that then shapes our decisions and we act them out. Or to put it another way, when a person acts in such a way because they have had thoughts about the need to act that way, then they're acting in respect to their own thoughts. If they do that without reflection, if they just act upon it because they've had that thought, they're already involved in identifying with ego. That's the ego. Now, if, however, there's any pause and you want to make sure that that thought really represents your highest view or your natural view, then you're bringing in a self-reflection to it. Then you are not identifying with the ego. You're identifying with the reflective capacity of the mind. In any case, now look here. If we have this identification with the ego, then the whole problem we have to make is a shift from the ego to the self. Now, that's an Eastern term, right? That's the self. That's the Atman. Or Greek philosophy, to know the self with a capital S. Now, how do you do it? He says, well, you have to do it in one way. And his way is always a way of no way. You have to simply learn to make a distinction. You have to learn to make a distinction between these two. That's the goal. There's no struggle involved. You just have to know how to make the distinction between the two, just as I did a moment ago. He said, now, there are two basic ways you can do that. You can explore that difference between the ego and the self. And if you do so, you're in yoga. Then you're in yoga, a meditative technique 
requires teacher-student relationships and practice, dedication, a term of involvement over time, supervised training. So now, Alan is quite aware of this development, all right? He talks about this in many places. But he actually then shifts, and he wants to go somewhere else to resolve this problem. And the problem, again, is how do you make the distinction between the ego and the self? He goes to Chinese philosophy. He goes, and what's most important, you see, in Chinese philosophy is this idea of Wu Shen. Now, if we can just get that one notion, we can see how Alan Watts moves through this problem of how to bring about or recognize self-realization or realization. Here it is. The whole thing is you're going to accept experiences as they come. You just let them be. You want them to be as free to be exactly what they are. Now, from the ego viewpoint, we want to control things. We want them to come out our way. We want to avoid this and go for that. We want to control it as much as we can to achieve our own goals. You say, no, 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 no. Have to accept experiences just as they come. Just the way they come. No struggle against them, with them, for them. Just let them be free to be exactly what they are. He often quotes Chuang Tzu. Now, Chuang Tzu is the great Chinese philosopher, and this is a great quote from him and from Alan Watts. Chuang Tzu employs his mind as a mirror. Now, doesn't that capture this? Right? Now, if you employ your mind as a mirror, right, if the mind functions like a mirror, Boy, there are several things we can immediately see. One is the, the mirror never struggles with its contents. It doesn't cling. It doesn't hold to them. It has no interrelationship with the contents. It's perfectly as it is, reflecting its, its particular object. Is That's the mind of Chuang Tzu. Essentially, how can we express that? In some way, it picks up that expression familiar to us all, the flow. Not only, it's not go with the flow, it's watch. Watch the flow. Watch the flow of events. Yourself. Watch. This is the key term. Now, therefore, look here. If you have to accept the experience as they come and let them be free to be exactly what they are, how do you do that? Well, you're just, you're watching them, so you're developing a watchful consciousness. Ah! When you're developing a watchful consciousness, you're pulling yourself away from identifying with the ego. That pulling away is already the process of learning to make the distinction between the ego and the soul. Ah, oh, pardon me, the ego and the... Uh, uh, yes, the self, okay? Now look here. What does that do? It shifts the center of consciousness. And then one discovers something very important. That this watcher, this mind functioning, this mind functioning, goes on all the time. Uninterrupted eternally, continuously, therefore, throughout. It watches, that's what it is. It always watches. Uh, Rama Maharshi picks this up, though Alan doesn't quote Rama Maharshi too much. Right? He talks about it as the, as the, who am I? What is watching? What is watching? Another way of expressing it is, is there a witness consciousness there or not? Is there a witness consciousness? Here, let me give you the problem of witness consciousness. Right now, right now, you're looking at me, paying attention to what we're 
what we're creating and what we're talking about. Now, are you conscious of what's going on here? Are you conscious of it? Or do you just have a thought of being conscious of it? Is there a witness consciousness? Or is there merely a thought that you have about, about a witness consciousness being there? The tension between these two, you see, the tension between these two is going to drive the particular person, you, in trying to discover whether there is a difference between these. To the degree that there's a difference, you're out of it. Well, this develops, this develops more and more a pure consciousness of the self. This very process develops a consciousness of the self. Alan calls that the pure consciousness of the self. That's what it is, a pure consciousness of the self. As a witness, as a watch. Well then, then what are you? If you're involved in this, what are you? Well then look her. Everything going on within you, everything going on within you, let us say there is a witness consciousness. Well, if there's a witness consciousness, there are two kinds of objects for it. You're also aware of your own thoughts, desires, feelings, emotions, drives, wishes. So that witness consciousness is aware of, let's call it that experience, and it's also aware of the external, what we call life, life experiences. So now you have a witness consciousness. It's aware of what's going on, even as you're talking and seeing, and it's also aware, therefore, of your inner drama, and it's also aware of the external world, as we call it or life experiences. Well then, would you not agree, what is it that you experience? You experience both of these, don't you? You experience both of these. You're conscious of both of these, aren't you? You're conscious of them both. If you're conscious of them both, what conclusions, therefore, will you come to quite naturally? That what you are is exactly what you will be and have just those experiences which you will experience. Hey, you know what you are? You're this and you're this. Well then, look here, then what are you? You are exactly what you will be, future, and have just those experiences which you will experience. Would you not agree? This is your experience, the external world as well as the internal. That is your experience, your experience. Therefore, you have, you have just those experiences which you will experience because Your past is acting itself out, or the past, the past, your past, is working itself out. So, well, therefore, what are you? Well, you have these experiences, they are your experiences, therefore, in a simple sense, you're going to have those experiences that are a result of all of this, your inner world, and you're going to be exactly what it is that you put together in your world, and that's going to affect all the experiences you have. 
therefore your life experience is also an impact impacting by your internal world and the intertwining of these two the intertwining of these two they're not separate constitutes your experience therefore you're going to have exactly the experiences you're going to have now wait a minute this is very strange if you're following this there's something curious going on here then if these are in a sense now a function of one or the other this is impacting this this is impacting this and there is this watcher that is experiencing it all huh Then this, then this watcher, we said before, goes on all the time, eternally. Well, then you know what? If it goes on eternally, then the self is infinite. Then the watcher is infinite. Ah! The supreme identity of the self and the infinite. Because this watcher, as you try to grasp exactly what it is, it has no marks. You can't look down in the corner of it and see that you made it. It's, it doesn't have your name on it. It has no marks. Can you describe what it is you're conscious of? If it has no marks, well then, that which has no marks can't go through any change can't go through any change whatever it is it's going to be what it is since it doesn't go through any change but say when you're taking a look at what you're conscious of right now what's the boundary of it what's the boundary of it look see if this is your life experience and you're conscious of all that you experience right? if you're conscious of all that you experience must not that watcher or consciousness embrace all your experience? If it embraces all your experience then, well then you know what? Does it have any boundary? Does it have any boundary? If it has no boundary then it's infinite. Can you find a boundary to consciousness? Take a look right now. Because if there isn't any boundary, as if this board, this board clearly has a boundary, the mirror has a boundary, all objects have a boundary, is there a boundary to consciousness, your consciousness? Is it, is it yours? Is there something there that has the consciousness? Well, I'll describe it then. Or is there just a pure consciousness and that's the self if it has no boundaries goes on all the time then it's not only infinite it's timeless and therefore the supreme identity of the self and with the infinite is established well how do you how can you see this how, how can you do it how can you make it part of your own rich experience there's no way. There is no way of how to do this. There's no question at all of how to do this. There is no question of your doing it at all. There is no thing that can do it or bring it about. Why? Because this ego is a fiction. Uh, it has a temporary unity to it, but it can't see. It's a collection, it's a unity. Therefore, there's no thing within you that can do this, that can bring this about. Well then, didn't we say it was a process? Yes, it is a process. It's a process that has nothing to do with the ego. It's going on all the time. See, it 
goes on all the time. It goes on all the time. Well, then we're already involved in a very interesting and complex game of realization. And all we have to do is become aware of the fact that that's what's going on. What will that bring us? Well, that will bring us into a very interesting state, you see, because I'm challenging you in this talk to try to establish the ego and the watcher or the witness consciousness. We're trying to find some way in which we can identify these. That's what we need to do. Well, we, to identify them, we need some kind of a boundary. We have to establish a boundary within which we can put it. And if we're going to say there's a difference between the ego and consciousness, or ego, consciousness, self, ego, consciousness, self, watcher, ego, consciousness, self, watcher, witness, consciousness, then you are going to have to, to the degree that you reflect on this talk, you're going to be looking to see whether or not you can put a boundary either on the ego, witness consciousness, self, or whatever it is that's watching and trying to understand at this very moment. If you can't find a boundary to it, if you can't find a boundary to it, and you persist in this, and if you persist in this, then Alan comes to this great conclusion. He says, Sooner or later, you will get a clear perception of the limitation of the ego. You'll see, naturally, as a result of the futility of your efforts, you will exhaust all of your efforts. You will then wake up to the fact that the ego is built in, whatever that is, you'll have a clear perception of the limitation of the ego. Its limitation means that you can therefore see that it is not what you are. And that clear perception will awaken you to a higher reality, which is the self. Now, this is the way Alan proceeds. Now, there's some interesting features about it and I'd like to stress them for a few minutes. First, as you can see, this comes about as close as you can imagine to a do-it-yourself mysticism. And by the way, they are some people for whom they can do it themselves. They are so ripe like fruit on the vine, right? They are so, so ripe that it drops and they don't need anybody or anything. Burke, the writer of uh, consciousness. Uh, there's many people have spontaneous religious and philosophical and spiritual experiences that don't require any tradition, training, cultivation. But for Alan, you see, while he doesn't say it, I'll say it for him. No teacher. No apprenticeship. No apprenticeship. That's very important for him. No apprenticeship is necessary. No personal dedication. No long years of study. This is called the quick school, of which the sixth patriarch is one of the great examples. All right, so then. Nowhere does he say, 
Therefore, you should go out and try to find someone who can help you with this. He doesn't even offer himself up as a teacher, though he has taught millions of people in this sense. Now, in his Beyond Theology as an example, he addresses himself to this. And he says, you can't really do this. He only spends a half, half a paragraph on this. He says, you can't really do this unless you cultivate breath control pranayama. He said, you need it. He says, equally well, you have to change your surroundings you have to find a place that's agreeable with you. You have to find a place, an environment where you can do this. And that's like finding your right work. Now, this is a very mild, yet it's an active contemplation that he's involved in. You see, right now I can go over here and I can have a sip of my tea. And I can say, what was tasting it? What was holding it? What was aware of the fluids? What did it do to my mouth? What was watching that? You see, I can do it in an active, wakeful meditation. I don't have to sit formally in meditation. Now, I have this problem I'd like to share with you then, all right? If you were going to master something like music, art, philosophy, any form, any subject, would it be important, would it be important at some point in the progress where you're trying to master these kinds of things, Right, literature, writing, right. sculpting. Is it ever important for an individual to take a look at what they're doing and come to the realization that maybe they're doing it wrong? Now, there are two ways of doing it wrong. You can, whatever it is you're doing, not know the right way to do it, and therefore you do it improperly. And the other way of doing it wrong is that you have some kind of a block or you have something within yourself that is antithetical to your achieving your goal. And therefore, you're not able to bring it to the degree of perfection that you need or want. Two ways of being wrong. Oh. Now, Is it possible, let me go one more step now, we're going to go back to the breathing, that the same thing may happen? That is, if you get a book on how to breathe properly, you don't have anybody checking, checking on you, checking to make sure whether or not you're doing something you don't know that you're doing, that's doing it wrong. In other words, 
there's a certain need for a certain kind of teacher, someone who can watch and correct only when you do it wrong. Point out the difficulties in what you're writing, painting, creating. Not telling you what to do, merely pointing out the wrong. The two kinds of wrong now, we said that, didn't we? Now, when you're in breath control, therefore, and you're reading about it or hearing about it from someone and decided to do it yourself, you may do it right, and you don't need any other reflection. And so be it. In the same way, you may study these things on your own, and you may not need it, and equally well, so be it. Now, there are two things, though, that are possible. One is that you, in fact, may do it right. And that may open you up, that may open you up to getting a variety of kinds of insights. Variety of kinds of insights into the subject itself and into yourself. So there are two kinds, right? Into the subject, your studying of your effort, and equally well, you can get an insight into not just the subject, but yourself. That's two. You might then get an insight into the study of breath, see what's happening to yourself. Then you're learning to make distinctions that you never saw before, but that the breath made you, became available. So therefore, you can make these distinctions especially about things like centering, about harmony, about tensions, about powers, about all kinds of circulations, all kinds of, you might call it neurophysiological, psychological phenomena that may go along with it. At those times, might it not be important to get someone who you can talk to who has a knowledge of that? Oh, you might therefore equally get insights into your subject matter. That would be worthwhile making a note of. Then you might get an insight into what you're doing wrong on the two levels that we mentioned a moment ago. So therefore, you might get an insight into your own ignorance. Two levels of ignorance. You might equally get some insights into the particular activity that you're engaged in, because it may open it up to a psychological dimension new to you such as we mentioned before, the centering phenomena, all kinds of neurophysiological, psychological experiences through breathing. And equally well, you can get an insight into the nature of breathing or whatever subject you're into. And therefore, you're getting an insight into your own ignorance and into the subject of your concern. So therefore, you should be able to make further distinctions in it, since you're now exploring both your own ignorance and breaking through that and discovering more depth in the subject matter. Now, at those times, would there be any value in checking it with someone else? That's the problem. Because for Alan, this is not in any way stressed. Now, I don't mean necessarily formally a teacher. Just, he doesn't stress the need to be a part of a community where this might be going on for shared experiences. 
for some kind of, watch now, we're going to go back to the term we used before, back to someone who themselves have watched this going on in themselves and perhaps can benefit, you can benefit from, from what they have watched themselves become. Watch there it come. Because you are going to get exactly those experiences which you will experience, only now I'm going to change that a bit, and I'm going to add to it that you have cultivated. That changes it, doesn't it? That changes it entirely. That aspect of it, Alan Watts does not go into. He doesn't go into that aspect of it. Now, there's another aspect of it that, that he doesn't go into. And that is, remember we said that when you get into the subject matter, right, you're going to discover all kinds of interesting distinctions as a consequence of the experiences you have. After all, the subject that you might be interested in is realization. Not music or literature or anything else, but realization. Therefore, by taking it in this way, you may then, as a consequence, discover all kinds of very interesting features in the process that's unfolding that you happen to be witnessing. These distinctions <clears throat> these distinctions can be hierarchically structured, better, more profound, less so. Some will be more valuable, more, more penetrating, have a greater clarity. Well, the distinctions then that you might experience in this process can then be put into words. Names can be, of course, put on them through those words, and they can become a part of, necessarily, a part of an organized unity. That's a philosophy. In other words, <clears throat> those people who take Alan Watts's advice in the way of realization and go ahead and do it are themselves going to take this as their object of concern. They are therefore, in terms of what we were talking about it before, they're going to discover those two areas of ignorance and the two areas of learning that we can put over here. They're then going to undoubtedly put it into words and names and bring it into an organized unity. And therefore, I suspect that the people then who are aware of what he's doing, have participated in what he is doing, will sooner or later emerge and produce some new perception, a new way of understanding this whole dimension that Alan Watts opened up, which is essentially a comparative study of, of different spiritual traditions. He introduced it. The people that are going to take it seriously and do it are going to do more than he did, necessarily, because he's restricted in two ways, the vocabulary of psychology and the vocabulary of Christianity does not lend itself to the exploration of these ideas and this type of experience. And he's aware of that. But that's the vehicle of the 50s, of the 60s, of the 70s, of which he was a product. 
So therefore, I think that we will see as a result of this, and he is a genius and a great writer, he will have started something very profound in the way of realization, and that is a group of people going into it, and in that sense, developing a Chinese Zhuangzi type of yoga, a watchful yoga, and they are going to then be able to make the distinctions. They are going to then pull it together on another different and more interesting level and produce something, therefore, that's going to emerge and continue perhaps in the tradition of the uh, transcendentalists that we once had in our country on the East Coast, Walt Whitman and those people. That's where this is going. So that um, you see, the, the, this though is the primary, the primary insight that Alan brings to us. If you find an interest in the subject, you already are in it. And that through this inner drive, this inner drive is already ordered and directed towards realization. You already are on the path. And his whole interest is to bring you to it. Now, he says that this path, the yoga path, is dangerous, far more dangerous than this way that he's introducing, the Chinese way. And it requires teachers and training and all of those things we mentioned before. The thing that he likes, therefore, about the uh, Wu Shen, or the Chinese Zhuangzi method, is that you can take where you are, you begin where you are, and you develop that one great thing, which is to employ your mind as a mirror. And if you do that, you're following Zhuangzi. But by the way, when you get into Zhuangzi, you're going to find it much richer than that. So, in any case, thank you. That's what I wanted to cover tonight. Ha! Ah. So then, it seems like, well, it... It seems like that Alan Watts functioned on a high level. Because you said that that's what he opened up. The people that follow him, that's what he opened up for them. And they must necessarily go beyond what he opened them up to. That's how he functions. Mm -hmm. Yes, you see, um, for the most part, For the most part, our culture, and I'm going to talk about it during when he was pushing from 40 to 1970, all right, or 1974. You can take nearly any book on Eastern thought off the shelves, and the odds are very, very high, that nearly all the books on the shelves that you will find were print, printed after 1960. First printing, before after 1960. People who were functioning intellectually from 40 to 60 had the following characteristics. They were all part of a Judeo-Christian tradition. They were all heavily involved by psychology. They were nearly totally devoid, lacking totally, Here's our timeline. Maybe I can devote two, time li two lines to this. Let's try it. All right. These people 
in this period of time have been kept from here is the great Greek Hellenic tradition, Hellenistic tradition, right, to the 6th century AD. This whole tradition they were kept from. Very few, very few, you could probably number them, you know, I dare say there was no college in 1940 to 1960 that had as a regular curriculum Proclus, Plotinus, Porphyry, the Neoplatonic thinkers. We, we, this culture, commits cultural genocide against our own spiritual heirs. This is our spiritual tradition. The Greeks are our spiritual tradition. With the advent of Christianity and science, psychology that they taught was nearly exclusively behaviorism and Freud. It had very little understanding of Carl Jung's, nor would they bring it into a classroom. Therefore, <clears throat> it was scientific Christian-based enclosed culture. On the other side, on the other side, there's a whole Eastern tradition of Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism, Confucianism and Taoism, developed over thousands of years. And that was never introduced in classrooms. One, two, three, never introduced. Alan Watts was one of the people who broke that. He tried to show the significance of this, and he also went to some Orthodox Greeks, Christians, Nicholas Berdyaev, and he also knew several key thinkers throughout this period that were responsive to this spiritual trend and didn't give voice to this Judaic Christian psychology stuff. So Alan Watts was one of the great people who opened it up. This, by the way, he avoided. He avoided the Greeks. We can go nearly to any book of his and we'll see that he avoided it. And he knew, he translated Pseudo-Dionysius, but he didn't bring it into these lectures. He didn't bring it into those. Now, what is significant about that? So what? Well, when you organize these kinds of insights into a unity and you structure them, then you're going to do what uh, Ken Wilbur is into. But you know what that is? That's merely taking this classic learning and giving it a modern dress. That's all it is. So therefore, people who are going to develop further what Alan Watts brought into or revived or brought to the surface for our attention, and then there were other people like him who were doing it. Gestalt psychology broke through the behaviorism and Adler became more popular though for a long time he wasn't. So therefore, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's tended the garden. He cultivated the garden. He opened it up. He got us out of the backyard, and he got us into a much more interesting garden of thought. And that's Alan Watts' great contribution. It's really tremendous. But there's still another one that has to be opened up. Taking the, the Hellenic tradition and it but he doesn't he doesn't give uh, he doesn't give enough credence to it. Transpersonal psychology is another area. They are now dealing with the need for hierarchically ordering experiences, but the whole idea of hierarchical ordering and how it can be 
structured and the philosophical framework to make it clear and to understand the processes between any hierarchically ordered system has already been developed and exists. And for him and others like him to ignore it is just very foolish. He does go into the good, the true, and the beautiful. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, he touches it. Sex ecology and spirituality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What he needs to do is to go into the commentary on Plato's Parmenides. He needs to go into the elements of theology of Proclus. He needs to go into the, the uh, works of Plotinus, especially the latter ones. Right, he should look into Porphyry, Damascus, but that's okay. That's part of our culture. Our culture is genocidal. Right. Because when the Christian, no, that's natural, you see, because when Christian triumphed, what they call the triumph of Christianity, it was the death of the classic world. I mean, that's what it means. I mean, it's nice that the Pope is being ecumenical, but let's hope they don't become the sole power because it's very likely, as any particular party becomes the sole power, um, the right wing, whatever that is, the most conservative elements in it, when they gain control, demand its popularity and exclude all dissenting voices. So, that was a long-winded exploration of what was behind that last question. Thank you.